here we are, Forensic Friday. For those of you who are new, Ed spent over 25 years in the NYPD, uh, over 15 of those years, and Ed's going to correct me. We're in the crime scene unit in forensics. He's processed over 2,500 crime scenes. He's been to death scenes, and he worked at the medical examiner's office. Ed, what's your take on these latest filings? It's so much to unpack. Yes, there are so many filings in this case as I was uh, going through them. I mean, the litany of, of claims by the defense attorney and, um, you know, a request to the judge and sealing things and trying to get things tossed out is tremendous. The current judge that we have now, he's this guy is no nonsense. Judge, and, you know, yeah, yeah. and he, he's he's calling it from the bench. He's not putting up with all of this nonsense and all of these all of these petitions. And he's just releasing buckets loads of uh, information about what's been going on behind the scenes. And now as things are trickling out, we're learning about text messages. We're learning about phone calls. We're learning about geofencing. We're learning, learning about fingernail scrapings and DNA under the nail. So many different things that we hadn't uh, been privy to before. I, I want to circle back to the DNA. Uh, everybody is talking about this. I want to kind of get into the possibilities these fingernail scrapings uh from maddie mogan's fingernail and they're people that are thinking like you know it's under their clippings that they take from each of the decedents but we showed and we did a complete show ed about the blood dripping out of the foundation of that home mm -hmm. and the crime scene was described by the coroner kathleen mabbitt as bloody gruesome multiple stab wounds to each of the victims Let's talk about it. You processed over 2,500 crime scenes. Any thoughts? Did, did anything about that seem odd to you? Yeah. Well, first of all, it seems like the blood was specifically located in the two bedrooms of the attacks, and and very little blood was elsewhere in, in the house. You know, and then there was blankets and bedding and carpet and, and hardwood floors, whatever the case may be. And a lot of the blood may have been absorbed in the mattress and the, sh and the bedding and so forth. And then we had blood come down the wall and come out through the foundation. So maybe these people in their excitement did not look as thoroughly uh, as you know you or I would have looked, okay? Um, the these are uh, young college kids. Um, you know, who were, you know, hyper at this time, very excited and not understanding what it is they were um, witnessing or looking at. But uh, that said, I take everything they, that happened on that phone call to 911 uh, with a grain of salt. Okay, so when you read the transcript, I'm, I'm looking at it. I, what I see is a bunch of, um, you know, very young people, maybe immature, overwhelmed by the totality of the circumstances there and not processing the information that they're actually seeing there or what's being said. And even the 911 dispatcher can't get this right because, you know, uh, she's she's being told about an unconscious person, right? And even that wasn't clear. Who was unconscious? Did right. one of the roommates pass out? Yeah. <laughs> or are they trying to describe one of the, the victims as being unconscious? Right. Okay. And, and and that's the, the that's a part that could be this could explain this whole thing is maybe as we heard early on the early reports when you know we've reported on this from early on uh it was said that it was one of the two surviving roommates that passed out uh, i believe bethany funk it was alleged that she passed out and dm uh was um you know awake so definitely a potential possibility here but what i'm saying is is if they say that um, they went and checked on the rooms and so, uh, it's alleged that one of the doors was locked and so forth, may maybe in fact they didn't see any blood, but it's just really strange that this murderer was able to go in, in a very short period of time, murder four college students to go in there and commit this crime and get out of there without any blood smeared on the wall or him stumbling or you know losing his footing and you know, trying to grab his balance and get out or blood on the door, uh, the sliding glass door leaving. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a hard pill to swallow. And he's carrying a vacuum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, a small vacuum. You know, some blood recovered on the banister and there was some bloody gloves found outside. You know, that's a big contention because it had both of those items come back to uh, two different unknown males. Okay. Unknown sets of DNA, right? Ed, correct me if I'm wrong because you're the expert at DNA. 
um, underneath the clippings that they took from um, from her uh, from her fingernails. So when they took Maddie Mogan's fingernail clippings, they came up with three sets of unknown, and it doesn't say male; it just says unknown DNA. Out at this corner club, it's packed. It's a Saturday night, college town. She's at the corner club, and that was from 2200, which is 10 o'clock, until 1.30 a.m. Her and her best friend are partying at the corner club, Kaylee Gonzalez. We see them at 1.45 at the grub truck, and then they get into the, the paid ride share, uh, paid ride, and they, they take off. But the possibilities at this corner club and at the, at the grub truck that sees tens of, you know, hundreds of people a night at the at the counter and all of this stuff the possibilities of that unknown dna underneath her fingernails could be endless but you know, she was clearly inebriated she was wearing a bigger jacket that was loaned to her by somebody else uh, that's not her jacket it's it's oversized um and they get the food and they go back to the house yes, so, thank, you. thank you very much they wait around for about 10 minutes Around 1.51 a.m., they grab food from the truck window and walk out of frame. Police confirm that at this point, they get picked up by a car service. And about six minutes later, they arrive at home on King Road. Uh, so how did they get from their residence to the club? Okay. Uh, and during that transportation to the club, were they touching anything or touching any people? Now they're at the club and they're partying and they're dancing and maybe they're touching people. Okay. We, we don't know the exact source of the DNA. Nothing said there was blood under the fingernails, right? Not, and it wasn't discussed yet that this was uh, skin cells. Right. So we don't know what the actual source of the DNA is. Could it be sebaceous gland material? Could it be oils? Could it be sweat? If you're at a club and you're dancing and you're touching um, men and touching women, women are touching men, whatever the case may be, all right? Could it have been at the food truck, right, uh, where there's, you know, there's touching going on. That jacket, one of them was wearing. Whose jacket was that? Was it a male's jacket? It was a male's jacket. From right, so could putting her arm into the sleeve, running her fingernails down the inside of the jacket, picked up some sebaceous oils uh, from the pores and sweat and so forth from that jacket, uh, and then got underneath her nails? Did she yeah. get in a car? Get inside that rideshare car. That right, short she gets flight. inside a rideshare car. How many people go through an Uber or a, a Lyft in an evening? Okay, um, especially in a, on an evening like this, club nights, pe uh, college kids. You know, they're not cleaning the back seats of these cars between occupants. So if you just touch the surfaces in the car, the um, the seating material, whether it's fabric or leather, whatever the case may be, th then you can transfer that material under the nails as well. And especially in an Uber or a Lyft, you may have like four or five different person's DNA that you just transfer to your clothing, to your hands, to your skin, to underneath your fingernails. You know, when you touch the ATM buttons, you know, uh, who, who touched the ATM buttons before you? Right. Okay, right. so you know, like, or elevator buttons, ATM buttons. You know, I don't know about any of you, right? Because of this stuff, right? I never use um, I mean, my wife does this too. She taught me actually. I never use the tips of my fingers. You know your knuckles. I use my knuckle. I do too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my wife does the same thing mm -hmm. in elevators, uh, ATM machines. Remember during COVID, we were putting gloves on, or some of you, some of us would use like a, a paper towel or a tissue or whatever. It was almost like um, what uh, Bill Murray did in What About Bob. Uh, he would use the tissue to open up the door. Those of you who have seen What About Bob, um, true crime enthusiasts will be like, oh, that's it. It's not Kohlberg. It's, it's a done. It's a wrap. I do say, when we, it's a legitimate question to ask, how, if there was a fight, uh, say, with Ethan, or um, it was alleged uh, Kaylee Gonzalez put up a fight, according to her father, uh, Steve said that she put up a fight, and even the the coroner, Kathleen Mabbitt, she said it appeared that one or more had defensive. Remember that, Ed? She yeah. said defensive wounds on the inside of the hands, and and again, like you know, we have to discuss this. And my apologies to family or anybody that's watching that's you know close to the family. Things that come into play, but people are are, are concerned of 
No DNA left behind by Brian Kohlberg other than the knife chief um, button. Um, you know, why no smears on the wall? But we don't know. I haven't seen the inside of the crime scene. Have you? Has anybody else seen the photographs and videos and the 3D laser scanning of 1122 King Roan? I haven't. Prosecutors, the defense, the investigators, those are the only ones that have seen that inside gruesome crime scene. Ed, you got something up on the screen? What do you um, got? Yeah, he said, Ed is doing a great job explaining why someone's touched DNA may be on a sheath when a person hasn't touched it either. No, not exactly. I'm talking about a mixture. Uh, you know, there was no mixture on the sheath. So that would mean in the conspiracy uh, of, of trying to set Brian Kohlberger up that someone had gotten a pristine DNA sample off of Brian and then placed it on the snap of the sheath to frame Brian Kohlberger. Yeah. That's, that's what you're talking about, okay? Uh, right. th as opposed to what I'm talking about, because these are mixtures. The, the, uh, the DNA from the sheath was not a mixture. At the, the trial, those gruesome photos and videos and 3D laser scanning will be presented. That is going to be presented, whether it will be broadcast out into the sphere, into YouTube land, I don't know. I hope so. It looks like it. the judge is open to that. So let's see how that goes. But get Look. back to her second question. Um, uh, the Hopefully the DNA al an analyst should be able to determine um, through series of testing, microscope, and so forth, uh, what the source of the DNA is. Now, <laughs> I see Joey Brooklyn. Hey, Joey. Uh, he wanted to kind of jump off topic here no, with the Gene Hackman and why. I, I do have some thoughts on that, and uh, we'll talk about it in another show, I guess. Shit.